Hello, I'm Dennis Polis. Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video, we're going to be continuing our discussion of free will by considering the topic of motivational determinism. In the last three videos, we've been considering the topic of free will. We began by considering the experiences which we interpret as free will to see if they're adequate to our interpretation we found that there are things which are actually in our power in a very well-defined sense and other things such as walking from california to england or teleporting to the moon which are not within our power if multiple possibilities are in our power then we are free freedom is essential to human responsibility if we're just cogs in a machine, if we're just gears turned by other gears, then we're not responsible for our actions. But if actions originate within us, if we make real choices, choosing to send our life in one direction or another, then we are responsible for our actions, at least some of them. So the idea of creative responsibility, of being the origin of our actions, is at the essence of free will. On the other hand, there are many ways to define freedom because freedom is defined as freedom from constraint and there are many ways in which we might be constrained. We looked at physical constraints and decided that physics did not apply to the mind because it abstracts away from the mind and has no data applicable to building a model of mind. But there are other ways in which we might be constrained and one of them is motivationally. If we are always bound to do the thing which most satisfies our libido or gives us the greatest utility or the most money or some other function which can be maximized, if that's what controls us, that is a form of motivational determinism. So we are going to be considering in this video the idea that we are determined by and controlled by our motivations and that whatever they add up to, that's what we have to choose. We saw in video 27 that randomly pressing one of two buttons doesn't really simulate ethical decision making because there is no motivation involved. Modern method actors recognize the importance of internal states and motivations in portraying human behavior. Determinists try to build on the fact that all rational behavior is motivated in one of two ways. First, they point out that whatever line of action we've chosen has been caused by the motivation for that line of action. Mother Teresa acted as she did because it gave her something she desired. The fact that she made people happy was not the compulsion behind her actions. However, the fulfillment she gave for making people happy was. This, in addition to other self-interested reasons. Right from the very beginning, I wanted to serve the poor purely for the love of God. Ignoring for the moment the wanton rejection of Mother Teresa's stated reasons for her actions, namely the love of God, the problem with this whole line of argument is that no matter what Mother Teresa decided to do, for example, if she had decided to devote her considerable talents to making an immense fortune, there would have been motivation behind her choice. So determinists would have looked at the motivation to make money and argued that that motivation determined her to make the decision she did. So no matter what decision she made, whether it was for good or ill, for selfish or unselfish reasons, they would claim that it was determined by her motivation. The plausibility of this comes from the fact that motivations do cause our choices. If we are inadequately motivated to choose A, we will not choose A. But that does not mean that motivations are the sole cause. We, as agents, are also causes, and by attending to this motivation or that, we determine their relative weights, as we saw in the last video. A second way in which motivation is used to argue for determinism is to argue that we must maximize some measure of motivation. For example, David Hume believed that we must maximize pleasure, and therefore we are determined by the maximization of pleasure. This is called hedonistic determinism. A more realistic model of motivation, however, shows that we have many motives which need to be satisfied at the same time. For example, in the 1940s, Abraham Maslow developed his famous hierarchy of needs, which range from physiological needs at the bottom to safety, loving and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization at the top. Once the lower needs are satisfied, we move up toward higher needs. While this is generally true, 
It is not a dogma. We know, for example, that various mystical and spiritual traditions, both East and West, suggest the denial of lower needs in order to achieve self-realization or spiritual ends. Similarly, when a transsexual person makes the brave decision to transition, that shows that we humans have the ability to place a commitment to self-actualization above our need for safety, belonging, and the esteem of others. Thus, while Maslow's hierarchy reflects a natural progression in which more fundamental needs are addressed first, it does not impose a deterministic set of priorities. Hume's hedonistic determinism suggests that there is some value, some function of, say, pleasure or libido, that must be maximized, and we are fated to do whatever maximizes that value. As Maslow and other psychologists who have studied human motivation have shown, human beings have many needs. Thus, for the idea of maximization to work, there must be some function of these needs, some function of our motivations, which can assign a value to each and every alternative that we're considering. Then our options can be ordered by the value of this function, and the one with the highest value is the one which motivational determinism forces upon us. Condorcet's voting paradox shows that this need not be the case. Consider a constituency, or a motivation X, which ranks alternatives in the order A, B, and C. Now consider another motivation Y, for which the best alternative is B, followed by C, and then A, and then finally another motivation Z, for which the ordering is C, A, and B. Now suppose that we're comparing alternatives A and B, and let's count the votes given to each. A gets the votes of X and Z, and B gets the vote of Y. We can symbolize this by saying that A is greater than B. Now let's run B against C. Again, B gets two votes, and C gets one vote. We can symbolize that as B is greater than C. So we expect that if we ran A against C, A would win. However, this is not the case. A only gets the vote of X, while C gets the vote of Y and Z. That means that A is less than C. There is no linear ordering of A, B, and C which will allow this to happen. That means that there is no value function that we can assign to different alternatives which allows them to be maximized. This means that the basic idea behind motivational determinism, that we can always rank order our alternatives, is just plain wrong. Thank you for watching and please leave comments.